Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Where is our... Good afternoon. Oh, to get my picture. And welcome. Good afternoon. My name's Isabel de Carries. I am the Chair of Trustees at Moray House Trust, and I'm the moderator for this event. Welcome to our fourth virtual event, Guyana's Oil Priorities for 2021. For those joining us for the first time tonight, Moray House Trust is a private, non-partisan, non-profit based in Georgetown and dedicated to promoting Guyanese culture and public discourse. A warm Guyanese welcome to our regulars. The trust was founded on the ethos that a culture thrives and develops where ideas circulate and are robustly debated and interrogated. To this end, we have convened panels to discuss everything from cricket to constitutional reform. Today's panel is the 10th event that we have organized on the topic of oil and gas. Five years on from the first major discovery in Guyana's waters, what is striking for those of us attempting to come to grips with the sector is how little homegrown data exists in the public sphere. Our maps are often rudimentary and archaic. Our graphs are no better. Surely the public should be drowning in up-to-date official data about oil. Does this absence of data reflect a deficit of knowledge or a lack of transparency? One has also a strong sense of a wait and see approach in our policy frameworks. To use a cricketing analogy, we seem to be constantly on the back foot. For example, oil related laws and contracts remain largely antiquated and legislation has lingered in the system for years. Ironically, where decisions have been taken, they have often been hasty and ill-considered, bereft of or in defiance of professional advice, a bit like a rookie batsman swinging wildly at the ball. To continue with cricket, oil is a test match, not a limited overs slog. We must pause, consider carefully what is best for Guyana, set our own tempo, gather our wits, and look the bowler in the eye. A word or two to explain the format for this event. Each member of the panel will speak for about 15 minutes, and then the panel will discuss Guyana's priorities. Afterwards, we will invite questions and comments from the floor. When we get to the Q&A segment, please use the raise your hand icon on Zoom if you'd like to ask a question. For those following on Facebook or YouTube, please use the chat option. Our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Vincent Adams. Dr. Adams, who has 30 years experience with the US Department of Energy, recently served as director of Guyana's Environmental Protection Agency. He holds a PhD in environmental engineering MS degrees in groundwater hydrology and geological engineering, petroleum engineering, and a BS in civil engineering. Over to you, Dr. Adams. Thanks, Isabel. Hey, I, I don't know how come you hadn't invited me to speak on your cricket panel here. That would be more fun, <laughs> I'm sure. But anyway, good afternoon, all the folks who have been able to join, and thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, Isabel, to speak on this distinguished panel and, and such an important current topic, the topic of our day, I must say, <laughs> that determines that uh, is definitely determining the future of Guyana. Now, I, the, the hot topics that I want to address with the high priority, of course, in starting in 2021 are contract renegotiations, the environment and EPA's role, 
gas to shore pipeline, the production strategy with respect to production rate and the sovereign wealth fund. And in, in other words, how do we spend the money generated from oil? Renegotiations, no doubt over the past five years, a barrage of criticism, including my fair share have been leveled at the past coalition government only because the agreement came to light after discovery when they were in office. The PPPC would have suffered the same fate of criticism had they been in office at that time. So this must never be made political. In fact, the agreement was signed originally in 1999 by Her Excellency President Janet Jagan, and the identical contract was signed again by then Minister Trotman in 2016, except for a couple of relatively minor changes, i.e. doubling the royalty from one to 2% and addition of the $18 million signature bonus. So this should not be political since both parties signed basically the same deal. And in all fairness to both parties, those initial decisions were made with knowledge available at the time and no one including the media, paid any attention until all was discovered, and understandably so. The lesson here is that the people of Guyana must be kept informed and have our say upfront rather than be Monday morning quarterbacking. At the same time, the government must be transparent in sharing of information with the public so as to earn trust in its decision making. What must be necessary for us from here on out though, is to acknowledge and understand where we fell short and use as a lessons learned to fix such shortcomings together, especially since we're seeing real for real what, what's happening and the true intentions of the operators. So it's no longer about speculation anymore. Anyway, to cut to the chase from day one, I felt that a contract should be renegotiated and even came out public on the front page of the Sunday Starbuck News on February the 4th, 2018. I recall that day very well. I, I, I you know, I, I, I called very strongly for renegotiations and a one billion signature bonus. You wouldn't believe I, I the, the, you know, I, I had some, I probably lost some friends or came crosswise with them, but nothing has since changed my position. But I'm still baffled as to why we are so apprehensive to approach Exxon to revise that contract. Since despite what may be, in, may be the impression of there, nothing in the agreement says that thou shalt not negotiate, renegotiate. As a matter of fact, the contract specifically allows for renegotiations, except under the condition upon consent of both parties. But for whatever reason, we have been reluctant to even engage Exxon about renegotiations. The good news is, however, that MP David Patterson, the shadow minister for oil and gas, has recently signaled the coalition support to the government on any move towards renegotiations. Some may say, where have they been in five years? But that notwithstanding, it gives the government cover to move forward without fear of internal political backlash. Look, the EPA has proven that the contract could be changed when we had the gall, and some say the spine, to demand and obtain the only unlimited liability coverage in the world for spills from the parent company. And in so doing, we went against the agreement, which allowed only for limiting liability coverage to self-insurance and insurance customary in the petroleum industry. Now, first, we talk about Exxon. This, this, this is not owned by Exxon. This operator here is, it's a limited liability cooperation and by, by, the, by the name alone, Limited liability, it's, it's, it's by definition, that's what it is. EPGL, SO Exploration Guyana Limited, had no assets at that time. Um, so I don't know how they would cover a large spill. 
Um, second, the customary insurance or the maximum insurance available in the industry was $2.5 billion. So we brought it to the attention of Exxon. We said, hey, what happens? British Petroleum is running a, a, a bill right now for maybe $70 billion. What happens if it goes over that $2.5 billion? They came over, okay, you know, they understand that it was reasonable and they agreed, even though they came back with Augusto. But we stood our ground because we thought it was the right thing to do for the country and Exxon conceded. In other words, EPA has proven that there could be renegotiations if we force the issue. The second thing we change in the, in the contract, it says you have to give them seven days notice. Now that's ludicrous before you visit. We said, no, we're gonna visit at any time. Um, at, uh, we feel like as if we want, uh, you know, it, it should be unfettered. Anytime we want to visit, we have the right to visit. They also agree to that. So I, so that still puzzled me as to why we do not even want to, 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 to approach them. And by the way, I am not faulting Exxon because, you know, I worked for British Petroleum at one time and those executives are doing their job in what is best interest of the cooperation. The bottom line is, of course, the, 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 the financial situation is to make money. That's what determines their promotions and big bonuses, et cetera. They didn't come here. And this is what we've got to understand. You know, I get, get the impression sometimes that we feel that Exxon and, and whoever else, I'm just using Exxon as an example, but when we have a company, a foreign, especially a foreign company, come, when they come in, we believe that they're coming to do us a favor. Um, they're not coming here, coming to Guyana to do us any favor. They're coming there to look after their self-interest, which is the bottom line to make money for their company. They're going to come in there and they're going to extract our resources for 20 years and they're gone. They could care less what happens to us afterwards. But we have to do our job on the other side to make sure that whatever they do, it's also in the best interest of our country. We welcome foreign in investors. It's necessary for development of the country. But we have to think when they're gone, what is going to be left of the country? We have to stop being intimidated and not allowed this disrespectfulness towards a sovereign country with such arrogant talk from their top, top official that they would take their business someplace else. To be honest, I wish we could call their bluff to see the swarm of other international oil developers tripping over each other to get in. But unfortunately, I don't think we understand the power of leverage we have here. Exxon needs us more than we need them especially now that they're facing some real financial challenges. They cannot survive without Guyana. Listen to this here, folks. Guyana right now accounts for more than one third of all of Exxon's mobile recovery reserves. One third. Their total is, I think when I last checked, it was like 22 point something bar, billion barrels. We already have put in the books 8 billion barrels and still more to, to, to come. Having said all of that, the most critical change that should be made in any renegotiations is abandonment of the production sharing agreement and go with concession type contracts, which is just royalty and fees. We do not have the capacity as we were experiencing right now to do PSAs. A lot of countries are have realized that and they're going back to these to, to these concession type contracts. All we need basically to put it very simply in a in a concession type contract is to be able to come barrels to make sure that 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 we have the, the meter running right, etc. And we get our 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 um our fees and taxes from whatever they 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 they, they sell or whatever is produced. In the current contract we have we've got to go look at their books and try to figure out you know, who they're giving contracts to, are they giving contracts to their, to their subsidiaries and what are the price they're charging, et cetera. It's a nightmare. We do not have the capacity to it. We need to abandon PSAs and go to concession type contracts. Let me go to environment and the EPA's role. Let me first say that the EPA is the critical agency when it comes to oil and gas oversight. But unfortunately, the, it has at least up to until two and two and a half years or two and a few years, months ago, only been an agency on paper and bereft 
of the tools and capacity to do his job. I remember Rod Henson, the head of EP of the of um, Exxon at the time, he used to always remind me all the time that it was the most important agency in the country. It was the it is it it was and is still the final gatekeeper to all the operations in the country. There are three things that are very critical for the EPA to adequately fulfill its legislative mandate. One, the government has to walk the talk by providing the resources to build its capacity in the form of qualified personnel and their tools to perform. We have to have qualified personnel that is equal to or better than the other folks that are on the other side of the table. It, two, the government has to ensure that the agency remains independent with no political interference. We cannot go back where we were. I remember when I just arrived at the agency, the one thing that I heard all the time from the staff is that, you know, the morale was so low. They said it's a waste of time because even if they make a decision, somebody would call a politician, they would get it overturned. Totally, totally damaging to the morale. Thirdly, and very importantly, the EPA is the only agency that overlaps the oversight of most of the other agencies and ministries' operations. And like many countries, should occupy a cabinet seat where policies are being made and the environment, especially where we are today in, in, in a developing where, we, where the economy is, is going to be quadrupling over the next four years, etc., Almost every single development will involve policies that involve the environment. So the, 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 the environmental agency head should be sitting there in cabinet rather than waiting for to get secondhand information and reacting. It should be part of those policies. The EPA came came did an unbelievable came an unbelievably far away in the last two years or so of its transformation. So we've made progress. Now we have a culture of customer service. Before that time, you know, workers come to work whenever they want. We had permit applications sitting there for years and, and they, they developed while the developers were, were illegally operating, etc. cetera. Um, staff is now coming to work on time and, and simple things like working during lunch. Um, I remember when, when, I, when I was interviewing for the job, the panel told me, that Vince, you know, all this stuff that you're planning to do, it's not real in Guyana. There's no way you can change the culture. Well, I think the staff have proven them wrong. All they were looking for was leadership and somebody or, 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 or the, the authority to give them the empowerment and the will to do things. That's all they were looking for. We have turned that agency completely wrong. One of the things, for example, we had one and a half vehicles to, to, to go around the country where you've got to do inspection all the time. And so we had like over 500 permits that had already expired. We went out there in one year, we collected over 100, about $150 million and we were able to buy 10 brand new vehicles. So now, you know, the, the staff can able to, to, to go there. Intensive training. We are now exposed to international, we're going to international conference. We are sponsoring training for the agency. Started recruiting scientists and engineers. Here's an agency that is supposed to be grounded in strong science and engineering. We did not have a single engineer. We had a few people with chemistry degrees, but the U, but UG was turning out a lot of graduates that from this environmental studies program that did no science whatsoever. But those were the staff that, so we're fixing that. We've started to fix it, to fix that. We've joined, we became the ninth member of what is called IOPA, the International Offshore Petroleum. It's the regulators of the major countries. There's a, there's a, a group that was formed out to the regulation, the regulator from all of the, the major countries. We became the ninth member and we formed a very close relationship, obviously, with the United States government. Um, the, the, the regulators of the oil industry because of my past connection with, with the US government. Um, we were also, we started rewriting the 24 year EPA Act. That act was written in 1996. It doesn't have a single word that says petroleum in that act. We're crafting new regulations and guidelines and more, more importantly, 
we've also worked with the World Bank to develop an entire unit, a petroleum unit of 26 highly skilled staff. The only thing is we hadn't started staffing the staff because we are waiting for this year's budget. So I am I'm pleading with the government to make sure that we, we, we started staffing that staff, the, th that unit, um, because we have to have 24 seven coverage on-site monitoring so that we can see exactly what's going on. You know, my experience over 90% of the times when you sit in your office and whatever the contract is reporting, nine, nine or even more percent, it's totally wrong as to, it's totally misleading as a matter of fact, as to what's going on. The other thing we've got to do, we've got to do a seismicity study, meaning to study the, the, the geology of the offshore on, you know, on the, the offshore um, on, the, on, the, on the ground to make sure that, the, that they're, they're not, the, those areas are not active or quakes, volcanoes. The Caribbean is, is, you know, has these things going on all the time. And could you imagine what happens if you get an earthquake or a volcano erupting and damaging oil wells, et cetera, and, and, and you could just imagine. So we've got to do that study. We've been after Exxon to do that kind of a study. And it's important that we do it right away. Develop technology such as the, this new technology um, it's called environmental DNA, which is looking at, at species or, 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 or feces and stuff, you, you know, stuff that comes from the, from the bodies, excretions from bodies of, of all the living organisms it, throughout the, the, the area in the water and stuff. And you can do that in real time and monitor to, and you can do, you can know, you know, how is it impacting the, the, the biota. Um, We've got to do a baseline study and a cumulative impact study. We've got to hold our operators accountable, even taking them to court. And you guys recall that I, well, not I, but the EPA, again, had the, 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 the gall to take Exxon to court. And when they didn't want to pay their, the, the measly fine, that is allowed. And I, you know, I, my understanding is now that that, that that case has been somehow withdrawn or put in the back burner, which is not good for the morale of the staff again. Flaring, we all know that the history of the flaring, we've got to tighten those permits. Even the permits that, that were issued before, we've got to go back and, 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 and change those permits, which is what I had started doing. The 12 billion cubic feet that was flared was totally avoidable. As a matter of fact, Exxon promised from day one that there will be no flaring. We should adopt the US standards of only allowing flaring for 48 hours to stabilize the equipment, not 60 days that we've now put into the, into, into the, into the, um, into agreement, into the plan that we've approved after I left. We must not, and this area is egregious more than anything else. Would you believe that Exxon is proposing that they said it's okay, we can flare and we can damage the environment because guess what? You have a pristine environment, so you've got a capacity to absorb. All of this stuff that we're putting out, it doesn't matter. You guys are pristine, you've got the capacity. Now, if that is not ludicrous and egregious and totally disrespectful, I don't know what else is. Ocean dumping of water. And Exxon has been misleading again in saying that the World Bank recommended, well, that's a total lie. The World Bank never recommended discharge in the ocean. The World Bank said that that has to be the last resort if it's not technically or financially feasible. Nobody can tell me that it's not technically, well, we know it's technically feasible. And you can't tell me it's not financially feasible. You know what's the cost for doing that? $300 million. You're telling me that the lives and the, 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 the health and, and, and safety and the environment of the Guyanese people is not worth $300 million when you're making tens of billions or even hundreds of billions of dollars. Reinjection of that water has to be, has to be and must be the only option. We've got, I just read recently that they're expecting to have like 10 FPSOs out there. Just looking at the Payara numbers alone, they're expecting the one time in the life of the Payara to, to be dumping over 200,000 barrels per day. Multiply that by 10. That would be 2 million barrels a day 
of, of that water. And in that water, they're allowed to, to within that water, it, it's allowed to have up to 0.42 milligrams per liter of oil. Just in one day, 2 million barrels per day is about 80 barrels of oil being dumped every single day into the water. On top of that, the temperature of that water get of the water that is being dumped is like 55 degrees centigrade. The, the temperature of the ocean water is what about, it's about 20, 22, 23 degrees centigrade. So it's over two and a half times. So you can't tell me I'm making public statements that is totally, as far as I'm concerned, it's irresponsible to say, well, there's no contaminant. So I don't know what, what, what's the big fault. It's nonsense. Um, a whole myriad of chemicals comes out of that water, including, by the way, radioactivity, just the natural radioactivity that is called normal occurring radioactive material norm. Um, the pipe, so let me get to the gas, to the, 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 the show pipeline that is going over to Wales. As a matter of fact, this pipeline is far past overdue. So the government should be commended for really aggressively pursuing this. But what I'm concerned about more than anything else is it's, it's the location where uh, my uh, understanding is 90% of the marine traffic that, that goes in and out of Guyana passes hit right there with anchors and everything else. And on top of that, of course, that pipeline is gonna be laid on the shore, like, you know, get back to earthquakes, more mudslides and those things that happen at, on, on ocean bottoms that can damage the pipeline. You get gas leaking and gas will be leaked. So you have to have some kind of a mint. I hope that the maintenance would be very rigorous to, to, to determine when you have it because it's very toxic. Gas leak is very toxic to, to fish life, et cetera. You have to have an EIA, environmental impact assessment. So I, I, if I'd be very, very disappointed if, if, if we do not do an, an EIA or the people do not demand that we do an EIA. Production strategy. And I know I might be in a minority here, um, when I, I support the fast production rate, um, we this country is desperately in need, and this also ties into the, the to the to the sovereign wealth fund too. This country is badly in need of money. We should get as much. We want that money right now. There's no need for us to be waiting, um, putting it putting it the, and, and string out. And all I hear, the only reason well, some you get it from you, we can't spend the money, which. <laughs> I, I, I still don't understand that part of it. Uh, and then the, the second thing is that, well, we're afraid that we're gonna you know, have corruption like we get in African countries. But then I don't hear that, you know, everybody talk about, okay, the, about the bad and, and I understand we've got issues, et cetera. But that's why you have leadership. Leadership has to have the will to, to Eliminate corruption, corruption and, and everything else that is get, that gets in the way. Hold people accountable. You know, I don't hear about the Kuwaits and the Saudi Arabias and those countries that produce in like hell, and their country have become the richest on the planet, even though all they have is oil and sand. We have water. We have, you know, climate all year round, et cetera. Everything on top of, of oil. So... You know, I think it's, I, I don't understand why we, you know, why we would even think about not producing as fast as possible. Um, I know that the other thing is, I, I don't know what, what the price of oil is going to be in, 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 in the future, especially, um, you know, when it's competing, it's competing against renewables. And with the new administration in the U.S., I guarantee you they're going to be pushing the rest of the world, even Exxon now was, has been decided they have to convert. They don't have a, a, a choice. Um, it's a good segue into this sovereign wealth fund. Again, it's the same reasoning. There's no need, to, in my opinion anyway, there's no need for any sovereign wealth fund when you need the money right now. Look at your, your daily life. You do not go a sovereign wealth fund, which is investment. You do not go and invest money unless you have extra cash and you already have food in your table and a place to sleep. We do not have that in the end. We need it right now. I prefer to put it in the bank. Don't tell me you can't spend it. Um, and again, the, the people who are gonna be re making this money are the foreign banks who are gonna be running these funds for us. 
Norway, they say, well, Norway has done well. Norway could afford to put it, put money in the sovereign wealth fund because they're rich already. Um, and then you hear, well, we've got to put it, put it aside for the next generation. Well, the next generation is now over 50, well, not over 50, just that 50% of Guyana's population is 25 years and under. Free education. All is not the future of Guyana either. It's, it's, to me, it's agriculture. Of course, education trumps everything, but we've got to provide education for our folks. What is gonna, all is only gonna be here for 20 years or so. So the point is we have got to decide what do we want Guyana to be in terms of a sustainable economy after all is gone. We have to invest that money right now, education, agriculture, infrastructure, health, et cetera. So that we won't have to be in renewables, obviously, so that you won't have to, 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 to depend on oil anymore and to attract foreign, um, um, foreign direct investment. Now, everything that I've said here and, the, and, and, you know, and the one thing that we have to have, and maybe it's there and I, I've been asking for it, I've never seen it, um, it's we need badly, urgently, a national strategic plan. First of all, all this money is going to be coming in. How is it going to be invested? I do not like to use the word spending. How is it going to be invested for the long-term future of Guyana? Then as part of that, important that I've made, I've made, you know, I've had conferences on this too, is the utilization, that strategic plan must have the utilization of the diaspora. You know, we still, it's sad to say, but we still have this colonial mentality where we believe that the, anything that comes from abroad, as long as it's not our people who is coming from abroad, it's gospel, and that's what we need to go, go with. We have we, this so-called brain drain. We should now be using it as a brain gain. I know we've got probably more Guyanese abroad than, than we have in Guyana, but you can find every single position and need in Guyana, advisory, et cetera, you can find a Guyanese in the diaspora can do it and do it better than than the than 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 the, than the other foreigners. Um, so we've got to change that 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 mindset. We love this hiring consultants, etc. But when a consultants come, consultant come, they all come in as they come in as a hired gun. They don't care about Guyana. They come in and make a few bucks and they leave. Guyanese, they still have their country at heart. Um, they've never really left by heart. They never physically, but that's what they're the ones who kept the, the economy going. So um, I think I'm going to end there um, on that note, but I think the diaspora part of it is, is very important. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've got to criticize the government um, from both parties. We've not been doing a good job of, of developing a diaspora plan. There was a plan that was developed here over the past several years. And it never saw the light today. We've got to start taking diaspora involvement very seriously. They can, they can, they can add a lot of value, overwhelming value to Guyana's development. So, Isabel, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you. And of course, you are Exhibit A on that uh, on that front. Um, <laughs> But uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you very I don't know much. That's good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> I won't get into that. Uh, we move now to Dr. Uh, Janet Bulkan. Dr. Bulkan is an anthropologist by training. She's the assistant professor for indigenous forestry in the Department of Forest Resources Management at the University of British Columbia. She founded the Amerindian Research Unit at the University of Guyana and served as its coordinator from 1985 to 1999. Over to you now, Dr. Bulkan. Thank you, Isabel. And um, I shall try to share my screen because I did prepare a, um, some, some slides. Mm -hmm. And thank you for, uh, uh, thanks to, uh, Vincent, for that wonderful, um, you know, explanation and gallop through a very complicated topic. So let's see if I can do the. Um, uh, Isabel, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. So 
I was asked to talk about some geopoli uh, oil priorities and look maybe at geopolitical uh, possibilities in 2021. And what I can bring to this panel is my commitment, my lifelong belief in citizen uh, in education. Vince mentioned that in citizen engagement, citizen science and citizen coalitions. And the themes I will talk about today are the current destructive practices. Vince mentioned some of those in Guyana's both uh, close to shore, inshore territorial sea and the EEZ. I will, I will be focusing on what we can do locally, local citizens, both in our communities and in with engagement with international conventions and processes. I think first off, I would say um, or emphasize that the threats to our environment are both inshore and offshore. They're now increasing reports on overfishing, uh, close to shore, wasteful fish fishing practices, and also good practices. Uh, like I mentioned Gatsop and their um, management of the seabob fishery. Uh, there's also discharge of untreated sewage. Anyone who walks along the seawall can see that on a daily basis. And as Vince mentioned uh, eloquently, of course, that the potentials for oil spills and the ongoing discharge of ballast water from oil, uh, oil tankers and, um, and ships, ships that are coming. So for Guyanese citizens, what leverages ex uh, or leverage ex uh, ex uh, is there for improvement beginning in 2021. I'll first talk about why should we be concerned and what can we do about this? First off, we share our ecosystem with non-human animals, the marine animals that are as important to long-term survival of the planet as humans are. Fishing is an important industry in Guyana. We as Guyanese, we have a sense of who we are from the fish in our diets getting increasingly more expensive, again, because of fishers having to spend a longer and longer periods to get fewer and smaller fish and the livelihoods of the fishers themselves. Uh, there's been talked about this, pollution from poorly regulated petroleum exploration and production activities. I want to, where, how did we get here? So Guyana has had uh, decades of exploration, uh, a lot of it inshore, uh, clo clo uh, close offshore for petroleum. Uh, most of that was coming up uh, dry. And in 1986, the legislation for petroleum was even then not state of the art. The Commonwealth Secretariat reports on that. And so, in the why did then ExxonMobil or XSO want a uh, uh, license beginning in 1999? My view is that Exxon knew already in 1999 because of its close connections with the, with the US Geological Survey that the Guyana Suriname Basin had immense petroleum probabilities. So knowing that it approached and asked, requested um, a, a petroleum production license, even though there was a background of dry with wells. That license was many times larger than the, the um, largest, which was supposed to be, which was in the 1986 legislation. And Chris Ram, who follows me, has written 80 columns on this. Uh, the, that license also um, had in, in it the need to relinquish on an annual basis some parts of the tract. Um, that was not done the, in the years following 2000. The USGS survey was done. It appears that no politicians read that survey. So that in 2008, by the time we get to 2008, the bridging deed has been kept secret. And then in 2015, close to the uh, national elections, ExxonMobil announced it had this large find offshore, 190 uh, uh, nautical miles offshore. A year later, 
five ministers went to Houston, compliments of Exxon, and signed a production sharing uh, agreement, which we now know is the worst in the world. They did not make that agreement known to the Guyanese public or that there was an $18 million um, uh, signing bonus. Again, very low by international standards. A year later, the production license was, again, another trip to Houston. Production license was, was, uh, was signed, never, has never been published, in spite of the commitment of the major political parties to make these license public. So where are we now? We are in a, a situation where the major parties, whether they are compromised or ashamed, uh, they uh, have never uh, have not made the, made the agreements public. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of uh, talk in the press about global witnesses withdrawal of its calculation that by uh, Guyana um, gave up a, a possible 55 billion US dollars in its 40 year agreement signed with Exxon Mobil. Uh, be that uh, Global Witness withdrew that because of its commitment to renewables and a, a different world. The point remains uh, that it was a massive giveaway and that point still holds. So against this background of executive arms of government uh, really being have not held to account for signing over national patrimony without ne negotiation, we can ask, what can citizens do? I suggest we have two potential avenues, uh, whether we're talking to political parties or executive arms of government, just anyone. They're national, there's a national uh, processes and both an international. Either or both in 2021, beginning would strengthen citizen consciousness vis-a-vis -vis government, vis-a-vis -vis political parties and the majors. Why would we bother? I think Vince laid out many of these um, reasons why I, um, the threats to the marine species, the fish on which we depend, and then the dangers of massive uh, pollution, not just from oil spills, but as Vince mentioned, from these FPSOs so that the, the ballast water which is in there, um, both in the um, both in the ships and in the tankers, which are coming, which then have to be um, discharged so as to load up with oil. So that, apart from the reinjection, simply that water, which is contains all kinds of contaminants, are an ever present and ongoing danger. What might citizens do? So we are. 80% of Guyanese live along the coastal plain. And I suggest that we can really begin, maybe small, and add to the, all the initiatives which are already ongoing to raise the consciousness in our villages. Cleanups are important. Every now and again, we see um, you know, a valiant little group of, of young people and others who are doing, you know, picking up all the bottles which are pelted into the, our environment. But cleanups by themselves are not going to um, are not going to evoke an emotional response in people. I suggest we can have, or villages might consider, fixed dates. For example, every Saturday, um, one Saturday per month, where people will gather or be invited to gather and sing songs and listen, have a skit. Uh, talk about what they've been doing, have some collect some baseline data. There are lots of lessons which are already out there from the communities in Alaska after the Exxon Valdez spill, what, what communities have been doing along the Gulf of Mexico after the Deepwater Horizon spill as well, um, that we can learn from and just incrementally build. There can be annual competitions or whatever, for regional competitions, what are villages doing or groups doing in villages? This is all underscored by our in our national constitution, the co-management, the rights of citizens, Article 13 speaks about the um, inclusionary democracy, Article 36 of our constitution on the rights to a clean environment, 149J, the government's 
responsibility to guarantee that. So do, if we begin at the level of citizens, we can add to best practices globally and fulfill our commitments to our constitution. Fishers, in the fishers who we see when we are at the seawall or along the rivers, I think I posit that they can be the front line of monitoring citizen science. You do not need a UG degree to begin to be incorporated in monitoring what's happening to the environment. So fishers who are going out every day, their local knowledge, we can, be, we can work with um, NGOs, with EPA, with government, to have systems of monitoring what's happening in our inshore waters, whether from the um, oil industry, testing and extraction, from um, the ballast water, and, and or from inshore fishing. So fishers can be able to report. Do you have oily sheen on the water? What about dead fish? Are there unusual concentrations? What about the smell of the air? If fishers then will see themselves as citizens of Guyana, not just as the poorest people who are invisible to everyone else. I've read a study where Sea Conservation International in Suriname has a small study where they're working with um, owner operated fishing boats, not the, not the not the owners who are renting fishing boats and participating fishers are asked to look um, focus on gray snapper and sea trout. Uh, they fill up a form when they where they see these fish, when they see them, do they have ripe eggs? Such a project, um, which, is, which could be um, monitored for Guyana, would then be linked to, could be linked with NGOs, with government regulatory ish, um, agencies, and benefit from that uh, monitoring. Citizens petition, I think Chris was with me when we, I, had a, um, I led a citizens petition in 2007 against the forest bill. We just need more of these. Receipts from oil can be spent on sewage plants. We should lobby our parliamentarians um, as well. Now, I know I have 15 minutes, so I'm going to move on to how can we engage as citizens with international processes? Uh, one a very exciting um, um, process, which we might consider is giving legal personhood or asking for ju juristic personhood for the Atlantic. New Zealand has in 2017 gave right in their law have recognized Mount Taranaki as a legal person. In that same year, the Victorian parliament in Australia passed the, recognized the Yarra River as a person and more import, as, as importantly gave the Wurundjeri Aboriginal people the right to manage uh, in monitoring and management of that river. In Guyana, Guyana's Atlantic Ocean can also be seen as a legal person. It's Guyana's Atlantic Ocean is important to different constituencies in our ra ethnically ravaged country. So when Hindus left India, they brought with them their reverence for Ganga Mai, the river Ganges. And so anyone who's walking along the seawall can might see uh, sanctified food and flowers and lighted oils placed in the sea. We can use that as an emotional symbol for getting communities and their temples part of ocean protection and not just cleanup, but monitoring. Other religious faiths, Christians believe in the purifying power of water, so do Rastafari, we can all be mobilized immediately. In India as well, in 2017, the court in Uttarakhand recognized the river Ganges, Ganga Mai and Yamuna as legal entities. What about conventions? So Guyana has signed con conventions, a number of them, I'm going to just put them in my final slide because my time is up. Conventions which are signed and ratified by a government are binding on the parties which sign them. And so we can, as citizens, not just the, uh, our constitutional obligations, but we can look at the conventions and see how can like, they be enforced. Here's an example where it's been done already. Both Guyana and Suriname signed the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And because of that, um, both, both parties, are, had signed and ratified UNCLOSE after Suriname evicted um, the CGX um, um, 
exploration um, vehicle, uh, whatever it is, from mechanism from Guyana's uh, EEZ. We learned later that CGSX paid $10 million to the lawyer, for the lawyers who argued the case for Guyana before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. That uh, was settled in 2007, that case. ECLOS ruled on the equidistance rule, settling our eastern boundary. So that was recognized by CGX, uh, an oil company. In a similar way, citizens coalitions can scan the international covenants, which we have signed. Citizens can work with pro bono lawyers and, and investigate which of these articles we have, Guyana is um, in compliance with or in default with. And we can then, uh, even before we've exhausted domestic remedies, uh, write to, to the, the secretariats of these conventions and ask for um, report, uh, commissions to an inve investigation. Here are two examples. We're in front of for UN CER, United Nations Com Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. One led to a visit by a rapporteur to Guyana in 2004, another one in 2006, which was triggered by the work of the Amerindian People's Association in terms of the uh, deficiencies in the Amerindian Act. Why are these important? They will be important because companies like Exxon have are lawyered up. They pay for the best legal uh, 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 talent that is available. Those lawyers will look at um, if citizens are writing to uh, secretariats of, of conventions signed by Guyana, because they will not want their companies, their clients, to be named in any as, as part of any um, dereliction of duty. That's the value for us. EITI, Guyana signed it as a, as a condition of the money from Norway. EITI requires that the government publishes all contracts. Again, um, if Guyana does not publish this year, it will not be liable to get the 80 million or however many US dollars. We need to use those levers. Um, Vincent has talked about the EPA, so I shall not, just to say that from the citizens' point of view, citizens can insist on the EIAs and environmental managing permits with tight prescriptions. And lawyers and village working with NGOs, working with villages can prepare a model process. Here's what we need to do. Here's what we need to keep an eye on as well. As I've mentioned, we've ratified 32 conventions. The uh, International Maritime Organization lists them. Some about human lives, protecting the sea from pollution, from sewage, garbage, dumping, these are all can be monitored. They're, com uh, they're on compensation as well uh, if funds are inadequate. So here's my last slide. Our population, our economy is still largely tied to what happens on the coastlands, the locus of our government and economic power. We need as citizens to reverse the lack of attention to the vulnerability of our coast from both inshore pollution and degradation the irreversible impacts Vincent has uh, laid out um, from deep sea prospecting and, and prospecting and, and production, uh, even in the face of an oil industry which has set the terms of engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janet. That was uh, very interesting. Thank you. We move now to uh, our final member of the panel, Chris Ram. Chris has uh, almost 40 years experience as an accountant and auditor. He is a civil society advocate, attorney at law, newspaper columnist, and holds and LLM in oil and gas. Over to you, Chris. Thank you, Isabel. It's been three years since I have participated on a Maury House Trust panel. Um, and in that time, I think quite a, quite a bit of relevance has happened both in Guyana 
and internationally. Now, in the brief time available, um, and given that Janet and Vincent have done such a comprehensive and effective job, um, I don't think I'd be taking a lot of time. Um, but what I do, I am going to, uh, let, let me start by referring to a few items, um, the publication on recent withdrawal. Th this is what has happened since um, 2017, the publication on recent withdrawal of a damning report by Global Witness, the international NGO in the 2016 agreement signed by Trotman, several discoveries of hydrocarbon deposits by the Exxon-led consortium in the Starbuck block commencement of oil production in December 2019, a change of administration in Guyana. Um, I'm not sure what has happened with audits and pre-contract costs, but I will touch on that. Um, I will touch on local content, particularly since I seem to represent local content on this panel. Um, so thank you very much. Um, the decision to utilize natural gas in place of or in addition to heavy fuel in the, in the generation of electricity. Um, I will touch on legislation, um, which sadly has not had, has made absolutely no progress um, since we discovered oil in the first announcement in May 2015. That's over five years ago. What does that say about our country? Um, I, I'm going to refer briefly as well to the change of administration to the, uh, to the United States, um, because I do believe the election of Joe Biden in place of Donald Trump might change the equation when it comes to um, the environment and renewables. Now, I will start by saying that the decision by Global Witness to withdraw its report signed away, for whatever reason, has not only undermined the cause and efforts of the international investigation. And your community, but it leads you to wonder about their own, um, about the reason that they gave. And it was not surprising that Trotman, Minister Trotman, and the APNU immediately claimed that sign away was a political hatchet job. Um, the PPPC, which I had hoped would do something about the agreement, I could also now say that, look, this $55 billion that was signed away was a fiction and maybe the agreement is not so bad at all. Indeed, uh, whilst we criticized the agreement and criticized Trotman um, largely for integrity issues and um, you know, he kept saying confidentiality, which was absolutely um, untrue. I think the agreement was not only a bill as, as, as um, Dr. Adams has said, was not only um, adding to the 1999 agreement, but in fact, it was based on a 2012 model agreement that Robert Passod published. So we blame SO, obviously they took advantage, but we gave it to them. So um, yet in my view, the what, Whilst um, Global Witness has disappointed us, what I think was still available is the Clyde Report. The Clyde Report is an even more damning report, and it did no good to the reputation of Carl Greenwich and Sir Sridhar Framfel, both of whom have now been re retained by the PPPC administration to assist in Ghana's case against Venezuela. I had hoped that the PPP would have, um, and I, I, as I said, I've, I've been led to believe that they would review the contract because, and if they had used the Clyde report to which they have access, that review would have led inevitably to a call for the renegotiation of the contract. There was no way you could not have a renegotiation when you see what the Clyde report, which was commissioned by the APNO, said. Um, we've had several discoveries, of course, since then. I think it's about uh, 18 um, because we had a, a failure just yesterday. Uh, that, that, in fact, um, made Guyana overnight on a per capita basis. It has catapulted us 
to the top of the oil producing countries. And perhaps that helped to explain why the March 2nd, 2020 elections were so hotly contested. Any government with a weak in institutional infrastructure and the scale of resources available would want to have their hands, any government, on such resources, partly to make sure that the opposition doesn't get it. Um, and I think as well, the change in administration was significant. Now we know that despite the best efforts of the APNU, AFC, um, the election eventually went to the PPPC because the USA played what in my view was a very, not sole, but a decisive role in the APNU AFC conceding power. So that many persons who thought or hoped that the new administration would take a stand on what was clearly a lopsided agreement, no question about it, are disappointed and it now appears that the new administration is prepared to accept wholesale an agreement which not only contains unlawful provisions, but whose stabilization article, I think it's article 23, concedes effective sovereignty over an area that is 120% the size of Guyana. Just think of that, 120% of the size of Guyana, we have lost the capacity and our right to legislate on any issue that could be adverse to the contractors. We can, but if we do, you have to make good any economic consequence to the oil companies. We have had very little progress on the audits. We know that I think is an XC of the article of the agreement provides certain rules regarding audits. The 2016 agreement gave Guyana up to April 30, 2017 to agree the claim by Exxon and its partners for recovery of costs up to December 31, 2015, amounting to 460,000, um, 237918.8. And an estimated additional half a billion dollars between January 1, 2016 and June 2016, both under the Janet Jagan's 1999 agreement. Now, bear in mind, as I said, Madam Moderator, the date for Guyana to agree or challenge the figure was April 30th, 2017. We did absolutely nothing it passed without any action on Guyana's part, and these highly suspect numbers, I have publicly said in writing that those numbers do not add up. Certainly the numbers to December 31, 2015. We have by default had to accept those costs to be reimbursed to Exxon and its pre and its partners as pre-contract costs, purely because we've been sloppy. Guyana has up to two years to audit the accounts and records of the contractor under the agreement. Let me make clear that there is the, the Guyana Revenue Authority audit. There is the, um, the, the statutory audit. But those come no way close to meet the standards that you would expect in the kind of audit that is conceived and, concept, um, and expected under the agreement. Now. Applying, as of today, applying the agreement, the date for the audit of the records from beginning 1999, right through to December 31, 20, 2018, has expired. It may be in progress, we are not quite sure. Local content. Despite a mandatory requirement for satisfactory arrangements regarding local content before an exploratory, an exploration, or a production license can be issued, licenses have been issued under both the 1999 agreement and the 2016 agreement in violation of the law. 
And when I say the law, I mean the 1990, the 1985 Petroleum Exploration and Production Act and the 1985 Petroleum Exploration and Production Regulations. Now, um, what is very disappointing to me is the PPP allowed a Payara license, production license, without insisting on such conditions. Instead, it has appointed a review panel to look at prior studies. Now, all that can be expected is that some local content provisions will form part of the conditions under which future licenses will be issued. But we have, we, we have given up um, significant element there, as we have given up in, um, in ring fencing. I know my friend Vincent, for whom I have the greatest of respect, um, raised the question of, of um, natural gas in the generation of electricity. Now, we cannot forget that fossil fuel, although it is considerably less harmful to the environment than oil and gas, is still a fossil fuel. The government appears to have decided that the gas will be landed at Wales on the West Bank of Demerara, although the public is unclear how and when the decision was arrived at. It must not be forgotten that there are specific provisions in the agreement regarding associated and non-associated gas, giving the contractor five years to come up with a plan. It is only after the contractor provides notice to the government that its development plan does not include a plan to develop and utilize associated excess gas, that the gas is available free to the country of Guyana. So despite all the talking, and you know, sometimes I, I hear some sort of ignorance sometimes. All I can say is the government needs to be mindful of this provision. If it has negotiated, a variation of that provision, it should say so. It cannot be silent about it. And if it, if it says that it has negotiated that provision, because I'm not sure Exxon and its partners are really interested in associated gas. All the FPSOs, Vincent talked about 10, yes? Um, and one to one is when we agree out with all those capital costs, what do we do with the 10 P FPSOs? Because if we pay for it, it's ours. The government needs to be mindful of the provision and all the other costs involved in natural gas generated electricity, inclu including conversion or construction costs to GPL, construction of the pipeline, purchase price for natural gas, contractual provisions, the alternatives of generating generation using renewable resources such as hydro, solar, and wind. How can we just make a decision like this? I am afraid that we might be rushing into a decision without significant implications. We have gone headlong. We have not touched the regulatory regime. Um, the, the Natural Resource Fund Act is in place because it was in place when the PPPC came into power. By not touching it in any way, it means that all the money for the oil we get, for our share of oil, and incidentally, we have varied the agreement in relation to share of oil as well. So I agree with Vincent, this nonsense about we can't do, do anything, we've been doing it. Um, we haven't touched the Petroleum Commission. So what you, what you have is a, is a situation where the politicians in the absence of technical expertise make all the decisions in relation to the regulation. Um, well, you, you can say the EPA, I, I, I should um, recognize the EPA, um, but other than the EPA, where is the regulatory regime? I also believe that um, in, in the question of, of, of us where we are, would have to consider the implications of a change of administration in the United States of America. I am assuming that there will be a change on Wednesday. Um, it's clear that um, President-elect Joe Biden is going to take a different position from Donald Trump. 
on the issue of the environment and the Paris Agreement, etc. Now, all of those things will have implications. If I can go on quickly, Madam Chair, do, do I have, do I, how much time do I have left? Five minutes. Sorry, five, five minutes. minutes. Um, let me say, in terms of my priority, um, these are not sequential, but probably simultaneous. I would strongly advise, now, of course, given capacity, but we have to have a policy framework. We have no, we don't know what the policy framework is. Policy framework in relation to capacity building, local content, um, the, the whole question of a depletion policy. And I notice um, Dr. Adam seems to be in, um, in step with Dr. Jagbio, who has said, look, we, we don't need, we, we should produce as much as we can. Let me remind them that we have an article in the constitution that regulates that type of thing. And this happens to be our supreme law. Whether it is convenient or not, doesn't matter. Um, we have to deal with this audit as a priority. We have to deal with legislation. 1985, um, I was interested to, um, in, in Janet saying, Dr. Bulkan saying that um, even the, the Commonwealth Secretariat criticized it. It was, a, it was written by the Commonwealth Secretariat. Um, we need to deal with an institutional framework, whatever you want to call it. You need something like um, the commission, the Petroleum Commission, that has um, various departments, well-staffed and equipped to deal with local content, to deal with, with environmental issues, to deal with the whole set policy framework, supervision, oversight, um, advisory to the government, rather than leaving it to politicians. I'm always scared of leaving things to politicians, though I'm not suggesting that you leave it to civil society either, alone either. We have to deal with this question of renegotiation. And if, if some, some renegotiation is taking place, why not, why not most? You cannot. How can we leave that stability clause intact that says you can't touch these people for as long as they operate? Now, an Exxon has said they're going to be here for another 50 years. I think they can only be here for 40 years under the agreement. But that's a long time for you to cede um, sovereignty and jurisdiction over anybody, especially on what will be the major segment of your economy. We have to deal with the question, I, I think I, I said local content, um, capacity building bias, should it be bias in favor of, of, of resident Guyanese, um, non-resident Guyanese. We have to deal with this question of transparency and accountability. We must be mindful of the, the twin threats of the Dutch disease and the resource cost. We've already seen the Dutch disease and its impact on the fishing sector. I mean, I, I, you know, BV was one of the first to go. All the businesses um, on the lower east bank will disappear. We have to deal with those things. What is our policy? We have to, to enable and empower civil society. We have to have um, a clear business of education so that we, that's part of your capacity building. That's part of your local content. And how do we, how are we going to get there if we don't have policies? It seems to, seems to me that maybe because of, you know, um, Pompeo who has left no bridge unburnt, um, actually came to Guyana to congratulate um, Dr. Irfan Ali on, his, um, on the election of the PPP. Now he didn't come just for that. And we have to be mindful of what, is our relationship with Exxon and its partners. Because we, we keep talking about Exxon. Exxon is only 45%. Um, Hess is 25%. And Cenoc Nexon is 20%. And, and um, that's where we differ with, with Dr. Adams, who when he talked about 8 billion barrels on Exxon, because it's not all Exxons. But, um, 
those are some of the priorities. It's, it's, it's really, really um, a substantial body of work to be done. And um, the question is where, how, and when do we really start? We have, we have not got involved in that discussion as yet. And whether you talk about Article 13 or you talk about Article 149C, which, it, which makes consultation a constitutional right. And you talk about the, the 149J, I believe, dealing with the environment. Those things require people's participation. And sadly, um, yes, the PPPC has only been in um, power for five years, but they had time to prepare. And I, th I think what they need to do is to show some real serious um, interest in involving the public. I'm not saying that the, the priorities that I've listed are all worthy of immediate consideration. There, there must be others as well. But at least let us start and let us give the impression of starting. Having said that and having noted the message, I will now give back the, the microphone to the moderator. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would like to invite the uh, panel in, in alphabetical order. So reverting back to, to Vince, are there any comments, Vince, that you'd like to make on the other presentations or any queries or? Well, I, yeah, the, the one thing that caught my attention, and, and forgive me here, um, Chris, was the Clyde report. Apparently, that's a, a key report that I was not even familiar with. I've got to admit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I was, can send you. A I can send you a copy, Vince. Yeah, it seems. I have a copy. It, it seems if it's um, it's a you know it has a, the the other thing, Chris, um, local content, and I. Um, you know, we've got, if you, if you, if, if you read the local content document that was produced, it, it was really, we, again, we turning everything over to trust. It has no quantitative anything. It just telling the contractor here, you know, do, you know, we are expecting you to, to, to the maximum extent possible, hire and, and divvy up your contracts and you know and we leaving them to pass judgment as to how much basically it should be rather than having specific numbers and more importantly rather than putting it into legislation and putting it into the contract itself there's nothing binding they and i know what they, they're always going to come back and say well guess what you do not have the capacity for us to, to to hire, you know, this among the people, or hire, you know, you you know, you, you do not have the technical skills, etc. I know that that's a, that's going to be an excuse because I've experienced it, even even here in the United States. But there are ways to fixing that by putting it into legislation and putting direct numbers in it. For example, you know, you have to give out fifty percent or seventy percent or eighty percent of all of your contracts. To, to the to local businesses for it. I mean, I'm just using that as an example in terms of, of a number that you can measure and you can hold them accountable to write and, you know, it's vague and leaving everything up to them for to, 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 to pass judgment as to what's, you know, what, what's maximum. Okay. Madam Chair, you, should I respond to that? Uh, yes, you, you, you're welcome to. And, well, and in fact, Vincent, the legislation has it. Section 36 does talk about having your conditions and, and Section 36 of the Act, and then it's, it's advanced in the regulations. It, they, they must be acceptable to the minister. What has happened, there has been a dereliction of duty by successive ministers. But it is their, their duty bound to do it. Now, where I think we could have gone is like say the Bank of Ghana, the Financial Institutions Act or the, um, you have guidelines and you set quantitative measures. 
that you must do this. I have said time and again, um, Madam Moderator, you probably heard me. Oh my God, my has a good model as to what happens in terms of the first three years, five years, seven years, 10 years. What, what should take place? So it is not that we, we have to reinvent the wheel, it is here, but mm. people need to start reading and applying the legislation. Yep, I agree. The other thing, the other thing, um, um, Madam Chair, is, and I think this is really important, and reviews, you know, I think this government and even the past government from time to time, they every time they need a review or somebody to look at anything, yes, they run, well, Norway has to do it, Canada, up to recently, of course, with the, with the EPA, the Pyara, you know, so, out to the woodworks, you heard that there's a, a, a lady from Canada coming in to review it. When we have Guyanese, I think as a general principle, in terms of getting, you know, to, to, to people who are going to be looking out for Guyanese, they should be looking to Guyanese if we don't have it locally to be looking for Guyanese in the diaspora. Because I guarantee you can find a Guyanese for any need in Guyana to review anything. But we always, as soon as we need anything, is again, we going back to this colonial mentality where we believe our own is not worth it. You know, somebody has come from outside, as long as you come from outside and you probably got a, your skin is of a different color, et cetera, we, you know, we revere that type of stuff. When we've got, you know, we've got capable and competent people in Guyana itself and within the diaspora, we're willing to serve. So, uh, like I said before, you hire consultants, they're coming in there to make a quick buck. They hired guns, and it's totally different to Guyanese who will be coming in there to look after the interests of the country. And I think, I think that's something that we've got to change that mindset um, if we're going to get value for, for, for our buck. Okay. I'd like to just invite Janet to, if she, uh, if she has any uh, comments or queries on the other two presentations. I do see that there are some hands raised, and we will come to you next. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Um, my comment would be, or to both Vince and to uh, Chris, that you've listed excellent points, what needs, what needs to be done vis-a-vis -vis the oil majors, what Guyana needs to be done. But as I tried to say in my presentation, where is the leverage? We've had, we have in Guyana the kind of political uh, uh, the constitution and the political arrangements where power is concentrated in the executive arm of government. And that means president and ministers. And we also have at the same time a national assembly, which I, I mean, just either fails when they meet, they fail to be serious and they fail to scrutinize and they are whipped into line by the major political parties. So that is why I propose that if citizens are both educated, uh, form coalitions and are energized, we sit as citizens might then begin to insist when a company applies for a permit, an ER, an EIA, an EP permit, that they are not granted until the, they are much, they're tightened and therefore begin at the end of the citizens of Guyana to try to redress some of these um, the, the glaring inconsistencies that you've pointed out where nothing you know, has started, uh, Chris, um, in spite of so many months which have passed since the President Ali's administration. Um, yeah, so I think Guyanese can do a lot of what is, what, what is required, but without political leverage, nothing is probably going to happen. And I urge um, NGOs, coalitions of citizens to think about the possibilities we have. Exxon and the big majors can lawyer up. Those lawyers will pay attention to the kinds of reports which local people put together and present because they do not want to be named. They will not want their share prices to suffer, particularly as both of you mentioned, Exxon Mobil is already under scrutiny from its shareholders. We can do some things beginning immediately. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to invite, I think uh, uh, it was Vanda who uh, had her hand raised first, and then Audriana will come to you next, if that's okay. 
So, and, uh, so this is our first question from Vanda Radzik. Okay. Uh, um, hi. Thank you. Can you hear me, Isabel? We can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much um, to you and Maury House for initiating this excellent presentations all. Um, I have three questions, uh, one for each of the panelists um, that I'd like to ask. So first to um, Vincent Adams, and just to preface this by saying, and to commend you, sir, for the excellent leadership and example that you have given to us Guyanese through the EPA. There's been nobody like you, and um, it is a mystery to many of us in civil society as to why you are not there continuing to lead us at this point in time. So question, my question to you, sir, is um, first of all, if you could just say for the record, what is your current status? Um, are you in any ways still um, in an advisory capacity um, within Guyana and its oil and gas um, system or non-system? And um, can you comment on the illegal, Exxon is still illegally flaring. I think everybody knows, knows this now. And um, what really can be done to, to, to stop it? For Janet, I love the fact that you are urging civil society to once again take a stand and to open our mouths and speak loudly and clearly and collectively. And I love um, your recommendation for personhood, legal personhood for the Atlantic Ocean, our part of it. And I would like to extend that to our inland rivers like the Rupununi and the Mazaruni so that the gold mining pollution could stop despoiling um, those resources. And if they have the person who we've seen it in other countries, it's a wonderful thing. And can you maybe briefly say what can be three steps that we can take um, to have this done? And for Chris, well, commending him for his advocacy um, all the time. I want to ask Chris and maybe the others, um, I haven't heard mention of Troy Thomas, Dr. Troy Thomas, who took the case to court and won it in Guyana concerning the time frame for Exxon, and I think others, but for Exxon to have 40 years or whatever. Um, and the court of Guyana found that it was illegal that the maximum time under the EPA and our laws is five years, which I think opens an opportunity for civil society to renew and review, sorry, to review the terms of contract of the Exxon. And I'd, I'd like a comment on that um, from Chris, if possible. Thank you, Isabel. Okay. Vince, would you like to sure. kick off? That, Fairly briefly, all, please, sorry, because we have a lot of questions sure. thanks, brewing. Thanks, thanks, first of all, for, for your compliments. Um, as far as my status is concerned, no, I'm, I'm not uh, in any capacity connected to, to the government of Guyana. Before I took this job, obviously, even while I was working in the United States, I used to do voluntary work, coming home three, four times a year. My intention is to still continue to do that after, after COVID. Um, Exxon, in terms of the flaring, there's only one way you can stop the flaring is, is by putting it into, into the permits, especially at the EPA end where I work, to say that you cannot flare, period, and shut it down. What happened was, of course, like you said, they were you know, something questionable as to how I was removed because I stood up and that's exactly what I was going to do. Exxon promised from day one that there will be no flaring. We've been, they've been flaring for probably a year until it stopped and it took, it was totally and absolutely their fault. And because, because it there was a loophole in the, in the, in the permit, which I proceeded to shut and to, to change the, the permits that were issued and to, 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 to the restriction in the new permits. And maybe that's what part of what triggered why I'm not there. So, you know, right now I'm, I'm enjoying my, my retirement once again and, and looking forward to continue my voluntary work back home after, after COVID. Thank you, Janet. So Vanda, I'm, I think I said a couple of times, I'm not a lawyer, um, but I think what we can do as, as civil society First of all, look at legislation elsewhere for legal personhood um, and see, you know, how, because th those, that legislation is passed at the national level in national assemblies or parliaments. 
And I think if we had enough um, citizen groups across the coastal plain and in the interior who said, this, is, this makes sense for us. This is important to our, our identity as Guyanese, our identity as, as individual villages, our identity um, as for you know, the fishing communities. If we wanted to, we got, we got enough momentum for legal personhood, that would then could be, um, you could have signat signatories for that, large coalitions, and then that would be taken to the National Assembly. And I think if there's enough groundswell of support, I cannot think of parliamentarians who would find that um, difficult to support. Vanda, you and I know that we both were involved when the, the Parliament of Guyana National Assembly agreed unanimously to the Iwo Krama Act. It was seen as national, it transcended political party boundaries. Again, that was buttressed by the support, um, you, your work, Vanda, which I, give, I pay you tribute for, with communities to get them to that, you know, to, uh, to endorse it completely. Similarly, there can be national initiatives for legal personhood of the Atlantic, the Inju Atlantic, which I think you can get you can start, we can start with that and we'll build sense uh, coalitions and their confidence as citizens rather than subjects waiting for a handout. And then force the National Assembly to be, to think of issues which can transcend narrow political party um, al alignments and allegiances. So that would be my sense of, of moving. And I agree with you, the, in, the interior villages as well, who, you know, what, we, what I've said before, what I say before, we take national patrimony, which is publicly owned by Guyanese, and that is privatized by companies. We give them, you know, for in Exxon, the EEPGL 40 years, but all the risks and the costs, the environmental degradation, it, those are socialized. Same for the interior, the communities who are left to deal with the de degradation of their economic, social, and environmental lives. So absolutely, I would um, agree, Vanda, that this is, this is a matter for citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, did you want to respond? We, we may have lost Chris temporarily. Ah. Well, a question, sorry, I, I, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, Janet, Troy has now um, given up the leadership of Transparency Institute, and I don't know if he had brought that action in his um, personal capacity or on behalf of Transparency Institute. The question has been asked, what can we do? Well, well, the opposition needs to do its work. Um, whether they, they feel compromised, whether or not they feel compromised, um, there is a natural resource committee in the National Assembly, but I, be I believe Parliament must do its work, civil society. What we need to do as well, we need to get people using the Access to Information Act. Demand information. That's what we need to do. Now, um, I just want to clarify. There is a single, in every case, there is a single petroleum agreement. Under the agreement, it allows for exploration licenses and production licenses. I think what, what um, Van was speaking about, that was an environmental permit. Um, but an exploration license goes first four years, then there's a first renewal of three years and a second renewal of three years. Um, because of the 2012 model agreement published um, by on, on Robert Passaud, instead of getting relinquishment early, you don't get until after the seven years. Now it would have meant that Exxon Mobil 1623, they would have been in Guyana 23 years before they give up an inch by way of relinquishment. And then, so you have 10 years for exploration licenses, production licenses, a first production license 20, and you have a 10 years. Um, so hopefully at the end of 40 years, um, whether we have any port oil, uh, but that, that, that's how the that's how the legislation works. But I would I would certainly advocate people start need to start using the access to information act because I I, I can say it. and I get worried when people say I'm not a lawyer, which is, um, 
but they're right. A colleague of mine, Raymond Gaskin, has been pleading with some lawyers, please bring an action for me. Lawyers don't want to touch anything anymore. Um, you know, there's too much um, of resources dangling. Everybody wants a, a, a slice of, of, of the pie. They, they ignore Guyana's interests. So Raymond Gaskin chased a lawyer for close to two years. And then nothing. His phone has gone silent. That's the tragedy of this place. Okay, thank you, Chris. Audriana, um, can we take your question now? Thank you very much, Isabel. And um, I must say to the Maury House that I really, really do appreciate this, um, this effort. To the panelists, excellent presentations. And um, it's really good work. I, it's not, I don't have a question, but I'd just like to make a few points after which I'd like to perhaps um, have for the discussions after this with Dr. Vincent Adams, um, Ms. Janet Bulkan, as well as Mr. Christopher Ram. I okay, study... I, I'm just going to interject because we have, a, yes. we have about a dozen questions uh, after you and uh, I'd like to give them some time as well. So, a okay, I'll be quick. I'll be Thank quick, you. perhaps a minute or two. Um, I studied, I did a master's of jurisprudence in rule of law for development. And I examine for my um, thesis, development preparedness, how can Guyana maintain the rule of law as a transition into uh, um, an oil and gas society? And I essentially examine cross-sectorial governance. So what I did, I examined development uh, investment treaties for countries which are resource rich countries and how they have, um, they use their investment agreements to capture greater value. So I looked at countries like Canada and the United States and Australia. And one of the reasons why both governments have not been, um, been re, 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 let's say, re, or changing the agreement with ExxonMobil is because of, it's very difficult to change investment agreements. And this is where we have to come back to investment um, law. Investment law essentially protects the investor. So what we have to do here is to understand, and this is where I'm still doing research, and this is why I'd like to have further discussions. Ms. Bulkan talked about, for example, the law of the sea. How can we examine, for example, or clarify what is, is the relationship between investment norms and, and the law of the sea? What are the tensions between investment laws and the law of the sea? Those are things that our legal community can do. How can we harmonize investment norms with the law of the sea, for example? How can we harmonize investment law with human rights, international human rights law, for example? One last point I'd like to make. One of the things that I've been examining is how can Guyana develop a model for our agreement so that we can capture more value? But to do that, for example, um, how can we include in there for indigenous peoples, for example, to be able to have access to justice if, um, let's say, there's an oil spill in, 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 an, in an Amerindian community? So those are four the aspects that we can discover because there are ways, for example, Canada and Australia, those countries have um, in their investment agreement now they, they have included clause in there that would allow for perhaps um, access to the local courts for third parties, for example. So those are things we can examine. There are a number of other things I'd like to mention, but because we don't have the time. But for persons who are interested in this area, we can have further discussions on um, conflict management, how we address conflict management, how we address the harmonization of international investment law, as well as with our local laws. How do we address issues such as um, human rights and uh, indigenous people's rights and how do we harmonize them? How do we get clarity as it relates to, to those rights and how do we um, perhaps, um, okay, there's a whole lot going on in my head, but I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to treat that if it's okay as a comment, Audriana, and then move on to some of the other questions on the other platforms. Um, so from uh, Ajay Pasram on Facebook, we have a question. Can the panel address the possible impact of earthquakes resulting from the extractive technology being used, namely fracking, 
Uh, Vince, would you like to? Sure. Um, it's and it's a, as a matter of fact, in reviewing the the, the Payara project, um, that was one of the issues that that I was insisting that they they are supposed to have been doing a study on that hadn't been completed prior to the to approval. But it's it's a serious it's a serious um, question and concern. Um, in terms of earthquake, be it earthquake or volcano, what we had requested is for them to do a really intensive study in, as to that area where they're drilling. Um, just to, I'm just talking about natural phenomena such as earthquake or volcano. If that happens, who know, you know, you've got wells down there, you've got these reservoirs, these wells are open, who knows what can happen. But on top of that, even injection, we know for a fact that injection can cause earthquakes. And especially if you already have the, the fracture available, what you do when you inject fluids into, into a reservoir or, or into any um, structure, underground structure, we've proven it, that when you inject it, what it does, the, the liquid itself, if, especially if it's, if it's liquid or so, it, it goes along the fracture phase and it becomes a lubricant. And that that's and you can trigger those earthquakes, and then that can also cause a disaster. Not only not only that, yeah, even if it doesn't cause, even yeah, though it, so even though it may not cause an earthquake, what it can do, mm -hmm. it can seep through those fractures and come to the to the surface, which means to the seabed, and then who knows where it ends up. So it's a serious question, and it's something that it has to be investigated. But again, you know, I, I don't know, you know, Exxon is reluctant to, to do these type of things and we are allowing them to, to, to get away with not doing it. So it, it's an issue and, and I think they, we as citizens of Guyana need to keep putting the pressure on them to be doing the minimum things that, that are required. Thank you, thank you for that, uh, Vince. We have a Question from uh, Daryl, I'm going to mispronounce this horribly, Nigaki, I think, on uh, YouTube. Can the EPA, I think this is for you again, Vince, sue the Guyanese ministers for dereliction of duty to keep the environment clean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I, well, of course, that's probably almost impossible for the EPA to sue the government of Ghana, but... <laughs> But I, I, I tell you what's what's happening there, and I, I'm gonna I think I'm touching on on on, on something that that even Chris said or implied. The problem we have in Guyana, and I was you know, and I I know that I went in there and I did a lot of things because without fear, but that's not the reality in Guyana. All of the people who were heads of agencies, etc., who were in high position, middle management, they work at the behest of the government, and it's such a close community. You do not want to go against a politician. And this has nothing to do with one party or the other. So you're afraid to, to make decisions, even though you know that it's the right thing. If a, if a politician calls you and say, here, you know, I've got a friend here, do this for me. So that's the culture that we have. Because if you don't do it, because your job is dependent upon it, and nobody's going to put their livelihood at risk. In my case, that could, that was, they couldn't have even think about it. You know, they, they're going to, you know, I, I never had any interferences. And it's not that I was special. It was because I was in a posi position where they couldn't do that. Um, you know, where I stood up, I hardly had any conversation with, with my minister or anything of the sort. And I, I went out there. As a matter of fact, my, the feedback that I was getting, they were glad that, that, that I was giving them cover, the politicians, because when... When the constituency calls them and say they said no, no, that this is one guy we can't, you know, we're not, you know, he we're not going to interfere. You better not let him know that you you're trying to go around him. But that's not the reality again with the people who are making the decisions, which is a sad state of affairs. Um, it, it's difficult to change it, but but that that is it. I mean, you can see, and I don't know if it happened in the last administration or not. You know, it was all of the news in terms of the number of people who were. Who lost their jobs when the new when the new um, administration came into being? Um, it's that that's the reality. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we have a 
I'll just circle back to the Zoom now. We have uh, Reverend Heliger who's been waiting very patiently. I unmute myself. Yes, there we go. Thank you and the three other panel members and uh, Mr. Kiris for your um, presentation. I would just like to know if you can shed some light on the sovereign fund or the trustees and if there is an advisory board, that's one, one thing. And then I have two questions, which uh, is the same in the same vein. Can you shed any light on any studies on capacity? And do you know anything of any strategy for absorption? Okay, Chris, would you like to take the first one and maybe um, Vince the second? The, the, the sovereign fund is actually called, I, I think, the Natural Resources Fund. Um, it's, it has, uh, first of all, the, I think what stands out is, are two things. The power of the minister in relation to the sovereign wealth fund. Although the, the, there are mechanisms and percentages, etc., cetera, um, not, not the most straightforward of, of formula. Um, the second, is that the funds are kept in the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States of America. And because the, the act has not been activated with all the, the mechanisms and controls, we don't have access to the money. It has about, I think, just around 200 million United States dollars, but Ghana cannot access it because it doesn't have the, um, the mechanisms. I know the government has said, look, um, they're not quite satisfied with the efficacy of the legislation. The problem is they have not brought any amendments to Parliament. They have not even initiated public discussions. So no one quite knows. Um, and unfortunately, I, I, I'm unable to assist um, Reverend Elliger on any more than that, that it's, the, the act has not been activated. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vince, would you like to talk about Yes, um, uh, by the way, hi, hi Reverend Heliger. It used to be a school. Maybe we grew up together in, in Christianburg, Linden. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, how are you doing? Hey, I, I, I wasn't clear in the second question about absorption in what, in what context. Um, well, in, 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 in the context of, you know, we we're talking about this money and you said, or you said, in your presentation that we need to spend the money now. Oh, I got you. Now. The okay. thing is that, you know, unless we have the capacity in economic development, those, these two issues always come up. Sure. Capacity and absorption. I got you. you. Know, I, so I, 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 I think I know what you, okay. And I've also addressed that in, in, in some of my presentations too. I, hey, you know, I, I wish, I would love to have that problem where I, and that was exactly what I remember when I asked for the billion dollars in, 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 in signature bonus, where the minister said, well, we don't have the capacity to spend, et cetera. Well, I prefer to put it in a, in, in, in a bank to gain interest. But what we're missing here, the most fundamental thing we're missing is a strategic plan. When, you know, when I worked for the U.S. government, every year we had to submit budget to Congress. But that budget was tied to a one year, a three year, a five year strategic plan. So, so, but we, you know, we do a budget for one year and it's, it's just like if it's in a vacuum by itself. We, we have to have a strategic plan. So there's a planning process and you see exactly where the money should be going, whether it, 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 maybe you wouldn't get anything within the first year, but how is this money going to be invested, et cetera. But what we are doing is piecemealing it on a you know on, on on a real time basis and that's not the way there has to be a planning process and that's completely missing no as far as i know there's no strategic planning which is key which is key to the spending of any money thank you thank you for that okay we have a question from stuart hughes um in the chat uh has there been any independent verification of the eight billion barrel reserve or is this information based solely on ExxonMobil's pronouncements? If there isn't, what's, what risk does this pose to Guyana? You want me to take that? 
Yes, please. I, yes. Yeah. Well, I. You know, I. No, they hadn't been been uh, as far as I know. All the 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 data comes out of 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 Exxon, but you know, I, I don't think I've got any issues with that. Exxon is not gonna. You know, they've they've got more accountability more than Guyana to deal with in terms of reporting numbers. So it's not just they can really nearly say, hey, you know, I'm gonna put eight billion barrels of oil in my books, so to make it make my books so to, to improve my fin financial appearance. They they're not gonna be allowed to do that and get away with it. So and one of the things that you remember in my presentation that I said we have to absolutely do is to make sure we build the capacity. It's not gonna be today or, or tomorrow, next year, or even the next five years, but we have to build a capacity to make sure that we have as qualified people as the Exxons of the world have. That's when I work for the US government, again, that's ex we invested heavily in training and we had, we had more firepower on our side than the contractors such as Exxons. And those. So that should be our goal. Rather than every time we need help, we call on somebody that is, you know, call on a foreigner who probably doesn't even have any kind of knowledge, but just because they put up a shingle saying that they're a consultant, they're from some foreign country. We accept, they say, come on and, and, and do your thing. No, we have got to set a vision for this country. And that's why I'm saying that the revenues from the oil and gas ought to go towards what is our vision. We have to establish a vision, whether it's a five years, 10 years from now, and work towards that vision. And that's where we have to be spending our money to achieve that vision. That's that's what the oil money is about. It's not for this oil to be around forever. We got to take advantage of this small window of time to, to invest, invest in capacity building. Um, so, yeah. Okay. No Adam, so if, I may, if I may just come in, um, sure. I can't be that emphatic about Exxon Mobil and, and their reputation. Exxon has a very poor reputation when it comes to cooking the books. Just read the, um, Steve Call's book, but um, I mean, there are, there are a lot of other cases where Exxon has not been um, some altar boy. And, and in fact, Vince, I have publicly said, written, that Exxon numbers do not add up. And I think I use strong, stronger language in that case. So I, I don't share, I, I don't agree with you that Exxon um, would not do these things. They, they, they've done it all the time. They've done it on environmental issues as well, about, about the impact of fossil yeah. fuel they yeah. have. No, no I, 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 I hear you, um, but that's why I'm saying, all I'm saying, I'm not, I, I don't know of any of any um, any validation of their of their numbers, but I don't expect that a company of, of and I hear what you're saying of they've been caught with their caught right. with their hands in the cookie jar from time to time. But then again, you know these these things are also verified or or looked at in the in the scientific environment when they publish data and that type of stuff. So. You know, I'm not. I'm not doubting you, Chris, because the the the, the facts the facts bear out what you're saying. You know, but but for, you know, I guess I'm more trustworthy than you are in in the, in terms of trusting, you know, what comes from your peers and do, and hope that they're, you know, they have the integrity to 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 not, you know, try to cook the science. Trust I, but verify. That's that's my motto. Yeah. I yeah. wonder if Janet can confirm. I have a a. a faint idea that there is another of those um, US geological surveys due shortly, and surely that might help to, um, to confirm. Um, I can't confirm or deny that. I haven't followed that, um, Isabel, but what I would say, to like to reference what the question, the answers to the question asked, um, can we take these companies um, to court, for example, and I think, yes, there's this culture of fear in Guyana that Vince mentioned. No, it's a small society. We're ethnically polarized. You can't get lawyers to take the case. That's all the, you know, the, that's Guyana for you, this pressure cooker. At the same time, I think we've seen elsewhere in places rather like Guyana where citizens coalitions then take that edge off. Because if a citizen's coalition believes in, a, whether it's believes in the Atlantic as a person or believes in their river as a person, and they work towards that, 
you know, the, the, um, it would be so, I think the, the Kaichio News, Tabruk News, the, the, the um, all the radio stations now, which are online, would welcome to do, you know, do be able to do uh, programs with exciting um, um, citizens, citizens initiatives relating to the sea coast, relating to their bits of the Atlantic. And I think those citizens can then take a case or, or, or try to find, uh, a, you know, get a case to go. And, you can, and that can be done. I mean, whether in Guyana that's not possible because, you know, our judiciary is as well, is, um, you know, just non-performing really, except for elections petitions. Uh, uh, with lawyers who are supportive, you can take a case to Belgium, for example. They will, t the Belgian system will listen to a case that is extraterritorial, so that outside of, of, of Belgium. And therefore, you, there'll be no one person who is standing up, like one Guyanese, but a coalition that takes that case. So, for example, uh, the regulations say 60 blocks, for example, that that's the maximum size of a licensed area. Uh, that's under the petroleum law regulations. The ExxonMobil tract is many times that. Why couldn't the Citizens Coalition make that a, a case? It's possible. It, but I, because I re, re, realistically, in my comments, I was suggesting we start, you know, something, don't, not, not wait for ExxonMobil money or anything, just all these little, all the young people who are doing things, they can ramp up, they can continue, ask Kaichur News or the radios to do a story. Let's build something that we are proud of as well. So I think, yes, we can take cases um, and look for lawyers elsewhere and go outside of Guyana um, as well. So I think pro bono lawyers can take cases to the commissions, to the UN, um, and, and to a place like the uh, judicial system in Belgium. So all is not lost. That's my view. Okay, thank you. I think Chris would like to... Yes, um... I'd like to draw attention to Section 31 of the Petroleum Exploration and Production Act. It, it talks about when petroleum has been discovered in a prospecting area and a licensee has pursued to Section 31 a 3 submitted to the minister evaluated test results. In other words, and again, this raises the necessity for a properly equipped petroleum commission because then the minister can say, look, I need these results independently evaluated or I will commission an independent evaluation the agreement, in my view, is not as bad as we're making it out to be. Right. Okay, that's interesting. Sorry, I meant the I meant the legislation. The, yes. the agreement is, is is worse than we're making it out to be. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, we are now approaching the end of our Q and A session. I'm going to take one final question from Facebook. I'm I've skipped over lots of questions. I apologize to everyone out there. Um, and ask each member of the panel to just give a final view on this as our wrap. So Sam Fender from Facebook asks a question. Should Guyana pursue gas to shore? And are we moving recklessly by pursuing it without known studies on its financial and environmental soundness? And we'll take you in alphabetical order, please. Okay. Um, the the, the, the short answer is, sure, we should pursue gas to shore. However, like everything else, you know, the, the whole environmental business or, or anything that you do, there is a risk and benefit. Everything in life, when you, know, when you get up in the morning and you go there, you drive your car, your automobile, there is a risk to driving automobiles. There is a risk of, of everything. So the benefits are obviously definitely significant in terms of providing cheap energy to, to develop the country, et cetera. However, we as, a, as citizens of this country have got to make sure that they go through every single hoop. And that is why I'm saying that I'd be shocked if anything else is required less than an environmental impact assessment where the public will be involved. You know, people like Christopher Ram and myself and Janet and, and you, Isabel, and everybody else, we're going to have an opportunity to be involved. And we've got to insist that they go through each of those hoops to make sure that it's done environmentally soundly. So, you know, I, I'm all for development and, and even producing oil, et cetera. 
but it has to be done properly to protect the environment. You know, the, we get back to, to, to the flaring and all this kind of stuff. It's no different. We allow the oil to be produced, but we should not be allowing flaring and dumping of water in the ocean and not doing a study in earthquakes, et cetera, in, in, the, uh, in, in the ocean. So, so yes, I support the, 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 gas, um, the gas pipeline. However, we have to do it in the right manner. Thank you. Janet? So, um, first off, I would say that gas, no to gas to shore, because this would, is incompatible with Guyana's NINDC under the Paris commitment. If we are to take seriously, we're already as a nation, given the current amount of production of petroleum, we're already probably in excess of what our uh, determined contributions are. This would just exacerbate gas to shore, would exacerbate that. Uh, Chris laid out the problems. Uh, I think Vince, you did as well. Guyana, we seem to be unable to manage even keeping the Demerara Harbor Bridge working. Ships which are coming in and hitting the bridge and, and they're not paying for the costs. That's because of lack, poor management of those blooming ships, much less a gas to shore pipeline. This is a recipe for disaster in the most populated part of Guyana. So we're committed to renewables under uh, LCDS, under green state development strategy. Let's take these things seriously. Let's invest in renewables to give our population uh, secure, reliable energy, but not gas to shore. Thank you. Thank you. Chris? Well, um, because there's a legal threshold for recklessly, I, I, I would avoid um, using that word, but it's clear that um, we are moving far too fast. Um, you would not normally, unless you have the capacity to enforce the law, you would not pass the law. But but we are we don't have the capacity to regulate petroleum and, and, and now an, an additional element, um, and we want to go that way. Now we must also bear man, and, and I'm speaking very briefly. We gas in this case is a byproduct. What do we do with it? And th those are some of the issues we have to address. Until we have dealt with the environmental impact, the social impact, the economic impact, financial impact, technological impact, um, I don't feel we will be ready to make the kind of decision. I'm conscious of what um, Janet is saying. Um, I am not sure I will go that far, but I, I am not unsympathetic to the idea. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to, I think, bring proceedings to a close uh, now. Um, don't like to run too far over two hours um, and uh, we have crossed that threshold. Um, final word of thanks to uh, our speakers tonight. We deeply appreciate their contribution to what promises to be a long conversation about oil uh, and its role in Guyana's future. Um, thank you to those, uh, to the audience, um, uh, both on the Zoom and the, the other platforms. Um, we will host more events like this. And I, I think, um, I mean, the message is, is loud and clear. Everyone needs to keep talking about uh, all these implications and agitating for what, uh, what they believe is, um, is important. Um, apathy is not, is not the answer here. Um, so thank you very much, panel. Thank you, audience. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all again um, shortly at, a, at another Moray House Trust event. And congratulations you to you on a job well done. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank, thank you, Isabel. And thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody, and, uh, and all the listeners. Excellent. Good evening. Excellent.